In this series of career sessions, all of our guests hold doctorates in their chosen field, and we invite them to talk about their pathway from PhD candidate to present day. We ask them what they've learned, and we also ask them to give advice to people who might be thinking about a career in research when they've finished school or when they've finished their undergraduate degree. Welcome to Career Sessions with your hosts, Steph and Tamara, proudly sponsored by Inspiring South Australia. We're speaking today with Dr. Gareth Ferber, who is a Flinders University graduate who completed his PhD in clinical psychology in 2006. Um, His thesis titled uh, Short-Term Psychosocial Change in Post-Acute Coronary Syndrome investigated the area of uh, psychological recovery following heart attack. Uh, In the 10 years following his PhD, Gareth has researched extensively in the field of child and adolescent mental health, generating an impressive track record of publications on a range of topics, uh, including uh, technology-based interventions, um, health-related quality of life measurement, and child and adolescent mental health um, service reform. These days, Gareth has returned to his old stomping grounds to work um, with the Health Counselling and Disability Services team at the Flinders University as an e-mental health project officer um, at the Student Centre. There are um, there his role focuses on supporting the well-being and productivity of staff and students in the Flinders community, and if that wasn't enough to fill his days. Gareth also co-manages an online community called the Psychology and Health Forum, is the editor of Seven Days of Psychology, a resource to teach the general public more about the role of um, psychologists, and a co-founder of the CPD Workbooks. So great to be talking to you today, Gareth. Thanks, Steph. Let's just start out by hearing about your day. What do you do? What is your role? And how is your day filled with work? Uh, Okay, so I work in a health counselling disability service at Flinders. Um, So that's providing, uh, surprise, surprise, health counselling and disability support (laughs) services to students. Um, It's it's very much a clinical service, so that's a lot of one-on-one work. Um, But my role is a little different. So um, I write about wellbeing, I write about productivity, uh, I teach about those topics. So I get called into to different student groups across different years to talk about those topics, um, how to build well-being, how to be more productive, how to balance those two. Uh, and then more recently, we've been developing specific programs. Um, we've just uh, launched one in relation to addressing procrastination. Uh, we're working mm-hmm. on one at the moment around mental fitness. Uh, we're collaborating with uh, the Wellbeing and Resilience Centre at Samri mm-hmm. um, to deliver their um, wellbeing program. Uh, so yeah, it's 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 really writing, uh, teaching, program development, and program delivery uh, with a, with very much a focus on the online space. So I imagine so. you've had a lot to do with students over this whole COVID, COVID situation period. <laughs> yeah. So uh, although surprisingly, um, in the initial response to COVID, the numbers coming to the service dropped. Um, which is not uh, altogether strange. Um, people are just uh, spending just, more time at home, and yeah, they're going to survival mode. They're they're, yeah. they're taking care of the, the just the everyday stuff that they've got to. So, um, and then what we're seeing now is a little bit of a spike um, in in students presenting. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I got called in to do a lot more online lectures. Um, so previously, I was. Uh, I would get called in and do just a traditional face-to-face lecture, uh, but now pretty much all the lecturing and teaching that I do is online. Um, And we'll probably keep it that way. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. To be honest, I really like it. It's 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 the space I'm most comfortable in, both in terms of the delivery of services, in terms of writing, in terms of teaching. Um, I really like the online space. I don't know exactly why that is. Um, I do like a crowd um, because you can read. Yeah, that energy and yeah, yeah, yeah. You can see how people are reacting to the content, but in the online space, there are some other dynamics that are opened up: chat dynamics, mm-hmm. um, polling dynamics, sh- uh, screen sharing, a whole bunch of little things that are open up to you that, that can change the nature of the way you teach. So, for me, and I, and I feel a little guilty of it, is the coronavirus period has has I've actually not enjoyed seeing people go through the stuff mm-hmm. they've gone through, but from a work perspective, it's been a very productive period. I'm impressed because I've got nothing done in the last two months. <laughs> and I found online teaching to be... Uh, Challenging. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I can definitely see it's got some great potential for mm. students who um, perhaps are a bit shy or um, there's a avenue for them with discussion boards and, and chat. Well, the other thing is we were limited to a certain extent that 
um, many of the programs we were delivering were site-based. So we're delivering on the Bedford Park campus, for example. So anyone that's on Sturt or Tonsley or here in the city or um, in the Northern Territory or in, in a satellite yeah. site didn't have access to our programs. Whereas now we're just really focused on getting them all online um, and often getting some of them out of hours as well. So students that are on placements or stuff can still connect into our programs, you know, from six to eight. So yes. tomorrow I run a program from yeah six to seven in the evening. So I grab a glass of wine and I teach people about procrastination <laughs> or how not to procrastinate. Back to when you were seven. No. <laughs> <laughs> so did your parents go to uni or are you a first generation uni? Student? No, I'm a, I'm a, a, a child of an academic family. So... Um, teaching qualifications in both parents and, and then uh, geologist with my dad. Um, and then my sister went to university as well. So it was really just, that was just the sort of expectation. Um, we didn't come from a family where we ran businesses or, um, or a particularly kind of hands-on practical trade-based family. We we're a family of, of, of book readers and, and, and writers. So um, that was that was pretty much the pathway that was laid out for me, um, and I'm quite happy with it. <laughs> <laughs> so you knew you were going to go to uni. Did you go straight after school? Like, yeah, I think I um, my uh, my year twelve got shifted, got split into two years. Um, so despite my incredible popularity now. Um, I wasn't quite so popular in year 11, so things <laughs> things went a little haywire for a while there. So I did year 12 over a couple of years. I think I might have taken a gap year. I can't 100% sure. I know I was working a fair bit, mm -hmm. um, but it, it feels like a fairly um, linear pathway through uh, study into university. Um, and wh where did you go to university? Uh, Flinders all the way through. Ah, uh, yes. Yep. 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 <laughs> um, and what was your undergraduate degree? Uh, psychology. So Bachelor of Psychology Honours, um, there's a few pathways into psychology. Uh, that one is the, the, the bluntest and most straightforward. Mm -hmm. um, it assumes you're going to do three undergraduate years and then an honours year as well. And you knew you wanted to do psychology when you came? Or? No. Um, I had no idea what I wanted to do post year 12. Um, I, just, I, I just put all the um, – I did what a lot of students do, which is pick a set of topics that um, – give you choice, mm. you know, so. Just keep the, um, the field open. Yeah, economics, and you'll, and you'll the sciences, yeah. uh, you know, maths one, maths two, uh, maths two, <laughs> um, uh, you know, and, and did well um, in most of them except maths two. Um, <laughs> and so that gave me choice. And then I just sat there with the, um, the, the manuals, you know, the university mm. manuals in which all the courses were described um, and narrowed it down to computer science and psychology because they both sounded interesting. Um, and I tell this tale, and I don't think it's a lie. I'm pretty confident in it, but it, it might be, you know, um, just for show now. But there was a flip of a coin moment because mm. like, I don't know which of these two to do, so I'll flip a coin. And I think it came up psychology and that classic test. If it comes up with that option. And you're not disappointed. Correct. Then you think, yeah. okay, that's cool. But I, um, there was no sort of no like. No best of three. <laughs> no, no best of three. Uh, and, but no driving force getting me into psychology other than curiosity. Um, that's, no, that's not a bad way to start. Yeah, Although yeah. psychology is not an easy road, so curiosity was allowed was able to keep you going. Yes, the only potential deviation is uh, first year psych. Um, you do a whole lot of electives. Um, I did economics. I was quite good at economics, and the economics people wanted me to shift degrees and come into economics instead. Um, but I was enjoying psychology mm. too much at that time, so um, I was pretty un unquestioningly. Uh, kind of psychology from the moment I started and, and, and all the way through. So the curiosity didn't wane. So did you, so your honours degree was part of your bachelor's degree? It was all in, all in one or you? you? You do the bachelor's degree and it's assumed that if you keep a certain GPA, you'll go straight into the honours stream. Okay. And so then you started your PhD straight after or how did you get to that? Yeah, I, I was... Um, I'd consider my life to be a series of fortunate events after one after another. So at the point at which I finished honours, I went, hmm, okay, what next? So I, I just started working um, just separately where I was at the time. Um, and then the psychology department developed uh, a new degree, a clinical PhD. So you get your clinical training, the equivalent of a master's in psychology, so you can get registered as a psychologist, mm -hmm. but you do a PhD at the same time. Oh, a two-for-one um, deal. That's pretty good. Yeah, so a four-year program. 
So they're developing that. My supervisor said interview for it. Um, uh, and she was on the interview panel and she <laughs> basically <laughs> said, we're probably going to be interested in hearing about the following things. So, um, uh, and then a scholarship opportunity because my honours grade was good enough. I fell into a scholarship category. Um, and to be honest, it was a no brainer. It was like, we'll pay you for another four years to keep studying something that you found interesting before. So, I was like, you, uh, duh. so it's just a series of, of a, a path that you just kept walking on really. It's not yeah. really, it wasn't really a decision to do a PhD. No, no. I don't think I was even registering at the time. Like I would have known that that was an option and I would, I knew that psychology was a degree that can't really finish at undergrad. Um, mm. You can, you can head off and you can use that information elsewhere, but psychology is a discipline. If you want to get into it, you're going to have to do some other uh, uh, higher level studies. So I knew that that was the case, but I, I, I wasn't, um, I wasn't clamoring at the bit to do a master's. I wasn't clamoring at the bit to do a, a, a PhD. So uh, <laughs> I was going to do psychology as an undergrad. And then I looked at how many years it was going to be yeah. and went, no, nah, no. Nah. <laughs> and now I'm at 14 years and counting. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. The study, your, your research, um, the psychosocial change in post-acute coronary syndrome, was that your project? Was it your decision or was it part of a larger grant? My decision, but part of, um, so I, I kept the same supervisor from honours to PhD. So we'd worked out in honours that we worked well together. Um, and then she offered a range of areas in which she'd be comfortable supervising. And then within that, I was able to sort of select um, so for example, she said health psychology is a space that she was happy to supervise in. Um, and health psychology is, is very roughly speaking, the application of psychology to areas more traditionally considered health, like, you know, cardiovascular and cancer and, and things like that. So, um, I'd been working in chronic obstructive pulmonary disease for my honors. Um, and then we knew the numbers for that were not so great in terms of, of maybe getting bigger trials up. We knew the numbers in terms of post-acute coronary syndrome were high. Um, so I just sort of shifted to the left, so to speak. I sort of shifted illness essentially, but mm -hmm. kept that same basic area. That's kind of what I did. Um, so what was the question that you wanted to answer with your project? Do you remember? Um, yeah, I do. It's, it, it's been a long time and also... You spend so much time in your PhD constructing a narrative at the end to tell a story that you want to tell, which is not necessarily the narrative you set out to, mm -hmm. to tell. But the basic narrative was we knew that rates of things like anxiety or depression or PTSD uh, were high in people who'd suffered a, a coronary syndrome, a heart attack, essentially. Um, uh, and I'd been training in, in different types of therapeutic modalities to, to treat those kind of conditions, CBT and motivational interviewing and um, ACT and uh, interpersonal um, psychotherapy. And my goal was, could I create an intervention, in this case, a written intervention that could modify the, the recovery trajectory, the psychological recovery trajectory for someone after a, a coronary event? Um, and that's what I wanted to know whether I could. Um, and I was interested in bibliotherapy at that stage, which is which is workbooks and mm. and and books and and read it's read stuff and self help kind of space. So that was really what I wanted to know: is could I make life better for people who'd had this event in their life? So you definitely had your eyes on the prize at the end. You wanted to have a product that you could improve like people's lives with. Yeah, I'd I'd like to create tangible things, whether it's mm -hmm. programs or books or blog posts or, or something. I like to see it, it it there and then I like to give it to people and then I like to just go, is that helpful in any way? Mm -hmm. And then they go, yes, it is. And I'll go, that's awesome. Or, and they go, no, that's uh, hot garbage. And, and I go, <laughs> okay, I'll have another crack at it and, and, and see if I can come up with something. So, um, yeah, that was – and it took me years to come back to that actual mm -hmm. realisation that that's what I um, – essentially want to do. Ah, so you were doing it but didn't really know that's what you were doing I, at the time. No, I didn't. It wasn't until years later when I came back to Flinders and I started doing similar work, not in the same space, obviously, not in a cardiac area, but still that same developing programs, developing written materials, developing stuff and giving it to people and, and, and seeing whether it was helpful that I realised, oh, that was the thing that was sustaining me during my mm. PhD. It wasn't actually the topic area or the illness per se. It, it was... Um, can I create something, put it out in the world and see whether it helps people? And then if it, if it does, that, like I said, that's awesome. If it doesn't, go back to the drawing board mm -hmm. and have another crack at it. So. so can you expand a little bit on what you actually did 
in your PhD. So how did you go through the process of developing an intervention? Yeah, so um, there was a good model already, a guy in the UK. I think his name was Bob Lewin. Um, I apologise if I've got that name incorrect. Um, but he'd sort of developed um, a program for in the UK for people who'd had a heart attack. It was workbook-based. Um, I got a copy of that and... and uh, um, I remember at the time thinking, okay, this is quite a good starting point. It's got information about the the illness. It's got um, the different things that people should do in terms of diet and, mm -hmm. and physical activity. But I thought I can enhance this with some of the stuff I've learned from cognitive behavioral therapy and motivational interviewing and interpersonal. I can get people to do some more deeper reflection work that I think will shift their psychological state. Um, so then we recruited, um, I, I apologize, I can't remember the numbers now. I reckon it's about 60 mm -hmm. um, in total people who'd, who'd had a coronary event um, and then we tracked them over time in terms of their psychological recovery and we randomised the one group to receive my workbook um, and one group to receive just a sort of um, an information pamphlet. Yeah, with the, the generic stuff that yeah, kind of a, care. A, a cut and paste from the National Heart Foundation. Yeah. Shout out to the National Heart Foundation. <laughs> um, so... And then just look to see whether their recovery was, whether we saw any kind of signs of improved psychological um, outcomes for those who got my workbook, mm. which, spoiler, there, there wasn't. So, uh, <laughs> but was, you know that now because you looked. <laughs> correct, correct. And that's a valuable lesson, uh, that, that, you know, if, you're, if, if part of your thing is, is creating programs or, or, or creating materials that are going to help people, um, that you want to help people, you have to learn to reject your own material at a point, mm. you know. And, and I spent a year solid writing that workbook. So there was a lot of heart and soul that went into that yeah. workbook and then to see it, um, it wasn't poorly received, you know, so people were just like very thankful to have got it, but it didn't shift the kind of things that we wanted to see it shift. So in that sense, it's like, okay, that's cool. Um, so that was a good lesson. Was, you, know, yeah. you can love the thing that you create, but you have to let it go as well. Yeah. So what was the most challenging part of your PhD, do you think? The only bit I really remember as 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 genuinely challenging is just the last writing, so the period. last slog where yeah. you have to get it all onto paper now. Yeah, all onto paper. You've spent you've spent a, a couple of years just thinking about the trial side of things, coordinating the trial. Has such and such got this? Have they been sent their questionnaires? Have they, mm. you know? And you've busied yourself with that kind of work. Now you have to sit down and tell the story, and then because the story I'd wanted to tell, which was. I have a triumphant workbook that fixes everything <laughs> was no longer the story. Um, then then I was like, okay, we, we have to try and tell a different narrative here. And that involved um, a shift in our statistical analysis. And then no one around me at the time knew the analysis mm -hmm. that was required. Um, so I spent a long time uh, fart assing around trying to work that out. Um, and in the end, uh, someone... Um, I think in the UK, and I apologize, I can't remember their name at the time, um, gave me a lot of the code mm. uh, that I needed because they'd done the work. So I was hugely thankful. But yeah, it was just that final writing slog and, and telling the story and feeling as though it was, even though it wasn't the story I originally wanted to tell, that it was still a good enough story. Mm. Um, did you write a thesis or did you do paper uh, by publication? I uh, wrote a thesis. Yeah. yeah so. I should have brought it in. It's a it's a tome, and in yes. fact, the guy, one of the guys who marked it, said this is a an absolute tome. <laughs> so it's it's because it's got the workbook built into the back, so it's this big, massive. It's, but it makes it impressive. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> you want it to make it thud when you drop it on the table. Yeah, and if I ever get a, a home intruder, then I, 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 I have, <laughs> have a weapon. <laughs> I have exactly what I need. Just a a, a good old fashioned thesis um, with the, the the regular layout. So. Um, I like the shift that I've seen since, you know, moving mm. to a kind of publication-based. You never get to write like that mm. in real life. Yeah. 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 So yeah. learning how to write papers is a, a good a thing. Unless you're a novelist. Yeah. 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 So with, did, you, did it take you long to have to, to switch, kind of pivot? You had to pivot with your, with your findings and what you found. Did it take you long, like... <laughs> Did you hang around the house for a couple of days ago? Oh, that was disappointing. And then get up and get on with it? Or did you just go, right, time to get on? I think there was probably an adjustment. I don't really remember it, but I do remember my supervisor at the time because um, I <laughs> I was writing stuff and giving it to her and she was like, Gareth, this is quite negative. Like you're sort of, <laughs> you're sort of 
there's a, a hint of um you know everything that we did was shit and nothing <laughs> works and it's all crap and i'm out um so at the time it must there must have been a in my head a difficulty and i probably i i overcompensated so rather than going okay it didn't work let's try and look at why that is i just went well this was a waste of time mm. um and, and tried to tell the waste of time story <laughs> um which isn't an easy story to tell it's not a convincing four story four years to of tell. wasting my time yeah that's right <laughs> thanks everyone for your support thanks mom and dad so there would have been an adjustment i don't really remember that but mm. uh, i remember um obviously i took the lesson from it which was you can work your ass you off power onto through. something, yeah, mm -hmm. and, and and it doesn't turn out as you want, but mm -hmm. you can that that's still important. Like it's still important to publish that information. And so, from your perspective of having been a student to having supervised students, what is the how would you describe the life of a PhD student? It's not all drinking at the pub. Well, no, it's <laughs> it's a it's a weird one because you're not. It's unpredictable. It's it. Um, you you know they're going to hit a challenge. You know you know something at some point in time is going to go wrong. Something with the design. Something with the measure. Something with the stats. Something with their life. Something is going to happen at some point. You don't necessarily know when that's the case, but you sort of have to try and um, uh, work around it. Um, that's the challenge. That's the bit that's sitting in your back of your head that you're maybe a little bit concerned about, but it's it's an incredibly powerful experience as well mm. you know you, you, you and you 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 get really distressed and and really um down on yourself and 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 then you come back from it mm. and that's a huge that's a huge journey when you see someone actually take that journey um it's really cool because uh, um you can't teach that lesson any other way mm. I can I can try and teach students about resilience and and and, and talk through it and give some strategies, but uh, very little teaches you like the actual events themselves. Because <laughs> like I spent so. three years doing this and I hit a wall, or I yeah, had to find a way around this. It's, it's not turning out the way I planned. It's an intellectual marathon. Um, I'm sure there's people that that cruise through their their PhDs, you know, relatively unscathed. Mm -hmm. But you don't hear about them because they're, you know, <laughs> they made it through in one piece. They made it through, the, <laughs> and and they're your boss the next second before you realise <laughs> they've, they've jumped over you. And they're, 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 so there's people that must cruise through relatively unscathed. But I would say for most people, it, it is an intellectual marathon, um, with many points along the way where they're just like, I'm out. This is mm. no, no amount of water or that that weird gel that they um, <laughs> that they <laughs> that they eat when in in marathons is going to get me through this, mm. and then they do, and then they get through, yeah, um, and they reach the end. So eventually, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you discuss some of the challenging stuff, um, but what is the most exciting thing that you experienced as part of your PhD journey? Mm, that's a good question. I think for me, all the value came afterwards. Mm. Um, in terms of realizing that I was a better person, that I was smarter, that I was more capable, that I was more confident. Um, at the time, my PhD, because it was a clinical PhD, most of the stuff I remember most as being exciting was actually more attached to the clinical side mm -hmm. of it than it was the, the PhD. It was the training to learn to deliver therapy. And we had a small group, so there was five of us just going through this PhD. So we were a very close-knit group. Um, that, were, that were with each other for four years. Um, so that's the bit I, that was the most exciting part of my PhD, which might not be other people's PhD because it, they don't necessarily have the clinical component yeah. to it. The, the PhD itself just felt like a job, like a job that you enjoyed, but still a job. Oh, I've got to send those questionnaires out. Mm. I've got to go to the hospital and recruit some people whilst they're, <laughs> and they're sitting in bed recovering after their heart attack. And you've, got, you've got to join my study, you know. Um, yes, please join my study. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh, they're always, you know, I'm always super surprised by how generous people are with their time, yeah. even in the worst oh, well, we've moments of their life. Project. Yeah. 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 The people who participate in, in research and stuff I did in child and adolescent mental health was also the same. I'm just like, Wow, you said yes to doing this research, and you're in the shittiest time of your life yeah. at the moment. Um, but you're willing to like try and share that. So that's um, that again is something that doesn't kind of maybe dawn on you until later in your own life when something goes wrong, and then you imagine, "Am I generous enough now to try if and somebody help someone approached else? my yeah, bedside? Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, I would say yes to describing this experience mm -hmm. to them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So would you do a PhD again? Yeah, 
Yeah, I'd do it. I'd do a second PhD if I if I if my life was set up in a way that made that possible. So you know, essentially, income wasn't an issue. If if all my shares in lithium mining just went <laughs> through the roof or something, then you know, and I, I was independently wealthy, then yeah, I, I would definitely consider going back. Mm. The benefit of going back at a, at an a older age is you you're more aware of your passion at that point. So you'll pick yeah. a passion project. Whereas when you do it when you're younger, you pick. It's partly passion, but it's also just it's partly about convenience. developing those skills. Yeah, that. that's right. It's, just yeah. A, it's a training. Uh, and so, yeah, why was your project important? What does what do we get out of your project? Well, Tamara, I would say, <laughs> oh, you told me not to swear. Uh, <laughs> what do we get out of my project? The thing I got out of it was we provide a lot of information to people, people who are going through, in that case, health complaints or mental health and and that information doesn't necessarily have that much of an impact. Um, and we need to think more strategically about the nature of the information that we provide people and how we provide it to them and 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 what invitation there is in there for self-reflection and, and, and the work we do. So and you see that, you know, you, just, you see that in the self-help section of a bookstore. You know, there's a million books, right? And and, and, and on every self-help topic that there is, you you can pick up a book on anything that you want to try and develop. Yet we know that literature doesn't move people forward a lot, um, mm. if if much at all. Um, so that's kind of where that's the thing that I got out of it. And and and, and, and at, at that time in cardiac disease, there was a lot of information being provided to people. This is what you should eat, and this mm. is this is how much exercise you should get, and eggs are bad, and eggs are good, and <laughs> eggs are bad, and eggs are good. Um, and <laughs> so there's this, there's a lot of information flying about, but you um, it's not necessarily making that big a difference. Um, Especially so. at that point of their lives when they're focused on, thank God I didn't die, um, telling them don't eat eggs or maybe eat eggs or maybe only this part of the egg is yeah. not necessarily going to be terribly, yeah. it's not going to land. Yeah, that's right. Um, and and the, the level of processing that the person's probably going to need to do in order to, to, to move psychologically is more than what we might think. Mm. You know, it was certainly more than what I thought at the time. But, you know, I had that 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 glow of psychology at that stage, which was like, I'm almost a psychologist and everything I say <laughs> is therapeutic. I'm sure that was therapeutic that I just said then. Um, so and so it was a good lesson to learn, no, it's a lot harder to, to shift people along mm. and, and, and make their lives better psychologically than, than you initially think. So, um, And I also learned that just in cardiac at the time, and I don't know where it is now, but uh, the post- uh, event care was really good. You know, one of the reasons why we didn't detect a difference um, in our oh, treatment group over already. our control group is that our control group did really well. That was because of cardiac rehab. Mm -hmm. That was because cardiologists are pretty on the ball in terms of, you know, um, getting medications in place mm -hmm. and, and, and things like that. So the care was already pretty decent. Um, so I was going up against, um, <laughs> you know, a, a, a situation a that was perhaps already, well, yeah, yeah, it was already yeah. pretty well. And not an underserviced population not that, that we sense. would have wanted that of course but it's always good to start with a population that really needs some um, yeah. support yeah, yeah. So yeah if you want to see a difference great yeah. so do you use your research skills in your role today indirectly sure i don't i don't i don't do anything that looks quite like research at the moment it is all really you know, I'm, I'm writing kind of blogs and courses course development maybe um and with some of the courses we've developed, we will start looking at wrapping some evaluation around it. Um, and some of our collaborations involve a little bit of uh, the evaluation side. So I'm really only using my research skills at a, at a very superficial level, um, an understanding of what other people are doing in terms of evaluation and understanding that the programs we create will eventually need evaluation and what that evaluation might look like. But no, at the moment, I'm in a very sort of kind of creative phase i'm building stuff mm -hmm. and then once stuff is built then i'll then, then i'll hand it over your, then i'll start yeah. get yeah. down to your analysis love yeah. um <laughs> yeah i'll probably i'll probably hand it off to someone else though no. to be honest like I, I think there's always something a bit um awkward about people testing their own therapies mm -hmm. um they not their own therapy per se if they're delivering it um but if you've created an intervention um and you think it's active um, and you think it's worthwhile, I think you actually do have to hand that over to someone else. Yeah. yeah. Train them to deliver it as, as well as, as you can and well as you feel, but then say, get me evidence that it either does or doesn't work. Yeah. Um, and ideally you'd say, prove to me that doesn't work. Yeah. So, 
Um, so you're part of a team now, so you can do that. Well, I'm not part of a research team though. Mm. So I sit in a clinical team. So it would mean, you know, getting master's students mm. or getting another PhD, you know, someone who, who who's in, that would form a, a realistic part of their mm. PhD. So it's probably going to be have to be in collaborations that, that I do that research. Um, so I'm more interested in creating the program and then handing it over and saying, um, tell me whether or not that does something. Um, because you've got no vested interest in it, but I do. Mm. You know, I care about that program, so I, uh, I'll somehow introduce some bias into how that's evaluated, yeah. Yeah. you know, which I, I can't, I don't want to do. Um, so when you finished your PhD, is this where you imagined you'd end up? This is kind of where, probably close to where I hoped I would mm. end up. So, yeah, creating programs, creating materials, putting them out, trying to help people. That was the essence of the PhD. I'm a I'm a little bit narked with myself that it it took me uh, ten years to work that out. Yeah. So because uh, you went the research route, I went I went a, a little bit clinical and a little bit research. I went completely out of my discipline. I went into child and adolescent mental health, and even though I worked with some awesome people and did some really good projects, I can't pretend like that was actually ever really a a, a passion. Mm. Um, I was more interested in the the people I was working with because I just met some you know really amazing people who were doing really interesting stuff, and I just gave them a, a, a little bit of my research knowledge and mm. my you know research discipline to it. But when that finished and I got out of it um, because a project ended, um, then it sort of actually dawned on me I was there way too long. Mm. I, I did that. Uh, I learned heaps, so I, I wouldn't rewind the time and do it differently, but I, I stayed in the wrong area for, mm. for, for a bit too long. So I've hit this one. I feel as though right now I'm like two or three years post-PhD. Yeah. That's actually how I feel, like where this is who I would have become post-PhD if I'd sort of stayed in mm. that program development, helping people build psychological health, helping people build well-being, resilience, that kind of thing. So you just bracket those 10 years like a... Yeah, you, you, a little you, learning phase. Yeah, you take those ten years. You go. Um, at least I, I, I worked. I built good relationships. Um, I wasn't an asshole. So, <laughs> uh, so, uh, a lot of and the reason I have the job I do now is because of just an inadvertent meeting that I had with that team at the time in relation to a project I was doing in child and adolescent health. Mm. And because I rocked up and I was just friendly and I shared my work and, and, and I was unprecious about it, years later when they're thinking about this role that I'm in now, they go, oh, remember that guy that came in and talked to us? Maybe he'd want it. So they contact me and I'm like, that sounds like a brilliant role. Mm. So there's a lot of things I did during that 10 years that were good, that were good for future me, good for well, current me now. Mm -hmm. um, but I was in the wrong area. So how did you get into that area in the first place? Like you finished your PhD and then what happened? I go to Centrelink. <laughs> um, so I'm really broke at the point at which I finished the PhD. I've yeah. burned through scholarship. I've burned through my shares. I've burned through, um, I think mum and dad were overseas. <laughs> They're just like, we're just going to leave the area. Um, <laughs> uh, and, and take our bank account us, with us. Yeah, right. money. Yeah. Uh, so... Uh, so I'm broke. Um, I had really good relationships with the child and adolescent service that I'd done my clinical placement on. Um, the psychiatrist there said, Gareth, I reckon I can get you a job. And I said, that that would be amazing because I really liked that team. Um, and uh, I really enjoyed my time there. And yeah, she got me a, a, a job there. And it was a research job with a little bit of a clinical built in. And yeah, the people kept me there. You know, and they gave me projects, and mm. I, I'm a project-based person. If you give me a project, yeah. whatever it is, a personal hobby or a professional, I'm like, ooh, and, and I dig into that. So curiosity got me and, yeah. and sustained me for the first four or five years of that, um, and then the last four or five years of that was when I was like, hang on, I might not be in the right area. But not so, entirely sure where you wanted to go next. Yeah, 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 that's it. I didn't, you know, I was, I was by that stage, I was well out of my of the cardiac space. Mm. And I was like, I don't really want to go back there. I'm, I'm happy to leave that chapter behind. So I couldn't go back to that. I mm. uh, didn't really want to stay in child and adolescent mental health and wasn't really keen at the time and trying to come up with a third area, mm. you know, because really academic, a lot of academic momentum is built by studying in an area, 
then studying a bit more in an area yeah. and doing a PhD in that area, then publishing in that area, then attracting funding in that area. So, you oh know, my if, gosh, you better like it by that stage. Yeah, you better really, really <laughs> like that. So I was like, oh, if I'm if I start a new space in my forties, you know, I'm never going to be an academic in that mm. sense. I'm never going to fit back into that space properly again. Um, and I think I agonised for a long time over that, thinking my only pathway was as a traditional academic. Mm. And uh, you do get a bit tunnel vision, like. Live, being in a um, university, you start thinking this is the only way it can be. Yeah, you you look at academia, um, and there's a lot of a lot of pluses about it. But there's a it's it's a you know I guess it's like any area. It's got its its downsides, and mm. and not a not a lot of people. I think those funnel charts that you see of the PhDs and the number of people that pop out at the end mm. with a, a significant academic career is mm. so. You're, you're virtually doomed from the beginning, right? You say, <laughs> but um, maybe they should share that chart earlier. <laughs> and you know, un, uh, unless you've got either the, the the intellectual chops, some people who are just are just flat out smart, mm. right? And they they can pump out and produce content at a, at a crazy rate. I'm not one of them. I'm 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 in the middle of the curve, competent, can put my pants on in the right direction, <laughs> can tie my shoelaces, and can do basic research all good. Mm. But I'm part of that big group that aren't necessarily um uh, uh leading the the intellectual pool and then sometimes psychological characteristics can support you there people are very driven mm -hmm. um very authoritarian you know are willing to play a pretty hard game that wasn't me either so i couldn't see it i couldn't see a space mm -hmm. in academia that i was going to carve out and got increasingly distressed about that like oh well, that's my only future mm -hmm. um and then thankfully the universe just went oh well that project's finished gareth you're, you're going to have to be creative and come up with something new mm -hmm. and something new came up so so do you think you could be where you are and you're something new without your phd no 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 i, I, could, I couldn't be doing what i'm doing now without the phd that's just i suppose that's just the path of the psychology degree though isn't it like you said earlier if you can jump out at the end of your um arts uh, at the end of your bachelor's mm. yeah but you're not going to be uh, you, you won't have enough of the skills that you need or the knowledge that you need in order to be pumping out documents and, and information for people yeah so i i need i need the discipline of psychology from which i can get the content that i teach but then i need the discipline of having done a phd to be even able to do that in the first place yes. what's really noticeable is when i interact when i interact with other phd people we're all in the same boat we all think the skill set that we have is kind of just like oh yeah it's a phd and the things that we can do as a result of phd mm -hmm. when you move into a population of people that don't have a phd and they start pointing out how do you do that mm -hmm. or how do, how do you organize your time how do you get that done how do you do this and you're like oh well, that, that's all that's the things actually I did a lot in my of things PhD. you did yeah that was all the mental discipline and, mm -hmm. and and fitness that i built during the phd that i didn't realize um, but is there now mm. that allows me to do that stuff. So the PhD is important, not just from the topic, probably less so the topic. Um, than the process and the... More so that, yeah, you just, you grow your capacity. You're a better thinker. You're a better mm. synthesizer. You're a better writer. Um, so then based on that, what is a PhD to you? To me, it was a, a, a training ground intellectually and and then emotionally mm. right so it's where you where you develop the if i use the language i use now the the, the mental fitness to be able to work at a high level mm. uh, to be able to think at a high level to be able to write it's that and then, and then then second it's the the development of your expertise in a specific area mm. so now for other people that's flipped for other people that the, the phd was the thing that got them into their area mm. that they now love and they work in and you know, so I've got friends who do PhDs in autism, for example, and now their careers are, are based around, you know, treating and understanding autism. Um, so that's flipped for them. It's the, the 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 topic first and the expertise, and then the thinking capacity second. Um, for me, it's the other way around. The the topic is less important. It just made me a better thinker, um, and and in, improved my mental fitness. So if you were talking to somebody who was contemplating doing a PhD at the end of their um, degrees, their undergraduate degrees, what what advice do you give somebody? I know it's obviously going to be based a lot on who the person is that you're speaking to, but just generally if, if, if somebody's listening who's wanting to get a bit of advice about going forward. The first one is is just assess your life 
as it is now and and try as best you can to fast forward three years time and do you have three years that you can realistically put towards it and i mean just pragmatically is there going to be a source of income that you can live on is there going to be um uh, is, is there some level of stability that you can have whilst that happens so that's the first one are you gonna is is, is your life gonna is be set even up feasible <laughs> yeah and and start from the assumption that you'll be a full time for the full length of the phd yeah. or if you go part-time you'll be part-time for six years or whatever yeah. that you have to extend out the time frame so that's the first bit of advice and that's hard because you can't really foretell the future but you can certainly determine whether you're in a spot now to do that and people grossly overestimate how much they can get done. Mm. PhD students do it all the time. <laughs> mm -hmm. so, like, I can do Wait, a PhD this... and uh, I've got seven kids and I run a business <laughs> and uh, I'm also a professional triathlete and all that. Okay, Not at some point people... in time, this is going to crash. <laughs> you can't sustain that many things. Not about people who go, I'm doing a PhD. Clearly, this is the time to have a baby. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well... <laughs> I'm looking at you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was not the best idea. But, you know, beautiful. Yes. Beautiful. The second is, is, is there a, a, a supervisor relationship? Mm -hmm. Is there someone that you get along with well who can be a supervisor, who has a shared interest area or has a project that you can join in on? Um, I'm, I'm not averse to people doing their PhD by simply just joining in on an existing project mm -hmm. and doing that. Yes, the topic might not end up being the thing you totally love, but you build all the the um, the skills that you mm. need. And then there was a third one that which left my head. But those are the two. Am I in a situation where I can do it? Do I know someone who can be a good um, supervisor? Because um, I think that's critical in in terms of your. Well, you'll hopefully be working effectively with them for at least three years. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. and under high pressure situation, both you and them. Because if they're in a position to be able to supervise, then they're living the academic life mm -hmm. and their life is hard. Mm -hmm. Their life is really hard. Um, so to have that that kind of relationship. And then third, is there an area you, you're interested in? That's really the third you one. You're going to dedicate your life to for three years. Yeah. yeah. They're, they're, you're like, well, actually, that's, that's a really interesting question. I'm, I'm, I'm genuinely curious about that or there's an opportunity, in my case, to build something. Or... And so with kids uh, finishing up school, or even kids who are thinking about school subjects for year 11 and 12, what there's a whole lot of pressure on these kids to make a decision about the rest of their life. So what do you say uh, for those kids who are worried about their future? Well, I can talk about the path I've taken. I can talk about the academic path and I can talk about whether or not there's kind of signs for them based on their, you know, how they're doing in year 10 and year 11 and year 12, whether that's a, a sensible path for them. But it's also reminding them that I'm just one of a number of different mm. pathways post school. Um, like I said, I was raised in an academic family. It was always expected that I go to university. I didn't find that a, a objectionable mm. uh, expectation. But there's, the, I had friends who took completely different pathways, you know, uh, into trades or went early, started working really early in their 15, 16, and then they work up. The, the line in the business that they're in and, you know, and they're um, earning more money and enjoying life far earlier than, <laughs> than I was in the context of doing an academic. So if you're doing well academically, uh, then, yeah, university is a good pathway and, mm. and, and it's a really valid choice. Um, but it's not, not your only one. Mm. Um, so you've got to be really careful not to put, if I'm giving advice, put myself up as some kind of, no, all this is all the, knowing guru. Yeah, yeah. All knowing, or that I'm that, that this is the pathway that should be taken. Mm -hmm. It was the pathway I should take. Mm -hmm. um, a sensible one for me to take, because you know, um, I, I I sucked at woodwork. Like you know, <laughs> the, the the woodworking teachers. There's a good reason why we're sitting in front of computers all day. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like we had two projects to do during woodworking year, and he let me get away with just doing one. <laughs> so I was like, yeah. You'll get hurt. Other people will get hurt. It's just, it's just not worth it. Just to yourself. Go back to the books, buddy. Just go back to the books. So um, I suppose in wrapping up, there are a lot of myths that I have heard mm. about being a PhD student or being a doctor. Or So what have you heard and what do you want to put an end to or, or you know, dispel, dispel a myth? Set the record straight. Set the record, Set the record straight. straight. But the main the main one is that you you will have to find there's there's not going to be at least in my experience there's not going to be this uh, extrinsic reward that comes to you from getting a PhD. Mm -hmm. 
it's not going to be you'll get a moment of of applause uh, yeah that's yeah. right at, at graduation <laughs> and you know uh, your mum or dad will pat you on the back yeah good work um <laughs> but that's not the thing to rely on the thing the, the, the thing you're going to have to generate is the intrinsic kind of like what did i get out of that how did that make me a better person um what did i learn in the process so if you're doing the phd hoping that it just opens up every door for you i'm not sure that's the 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 um the greatest way of looking yeah. at it i think more it's that it 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 gives you a much better toolkit to pick which doors mm-hmm. might you be appropriate. You want to start battering down. Yeah, exactly. That's a, that's a really good way of putting it. So um, that would be the main one. Is, is, and just to, just to protect against that that idea that you'll hurt to get it, like mm. it, it'll be painful to get in some way, shape or form. And then if you're really hoping that at the end of it there's a, a, like a, a massive payday. Yeah. Mm, yeah. <laughs> be be cautious about that. Now, it might be there, there, there will be people for whom that is the case because they might do work. And then they get this fabulous book or job opportunity or. Yeah, or, you know, th- those who are in maybe laboratory sciences who create something that then becomes, um, you know, they can market that. They mm. can, you know. The, 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 or you'll change the world with your PhD. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you develop yeah. a better solar cell or, yeah. you know, something that actually. So some people will. will achieve the kind of strike um, goal but most don't strike goal but yeah that's right that's yeah. right most are not most of us are here backing knocking down the doors still going come on yeah <laughs> yeah yeah i did the hard yards <laughs> um but it is it is cool to hear someone use doctor in front of your name for the first time <laughs> afterwards that's cool it was a um, it was a airline yes. i was getting onto an airplane and uh um I gave them my boarding pass and they, they said, oh, welcome, Dr. Ferber. And I went, <laughs> oh, that was a really stupid laugh because it's the first time I'd ever heard it, which it, which which ruined the moment for them because they're like, are you really a doctor or are you a mental patient? Um, but so, both, both. Yeah, possibly, that's right. Uh, one doesn't rule out the other. Um, so that was cool, but that was the biggest payday. <laughs> Excellent. Well, Thank you very much for your time and your generosity for supporting our little podcast. <laughs> oh, good. Yeah, thanks for having me and, and, and thanks Is for Is it the first time you've ever part. had an opportunity to reflect on that whole journey? Yeah, yeah I think so. Um, aside from my own reflection, mm-hmm. you know, I think so. I, I, haven't, I haven't ever really sat down with, with PhD students. I think there needs to be or, more or of that. People. There needs to be more of people with PhD sitting down and going, "This is what you're actually signing up for." Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, that's what you're. you're that's, that's what, what you're doing, doing now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that's why. Yeah, it's it, it's such a good initiative. Mm. So yeah, and no, I thank you for being uh, inviting me to be a part of it. You are welcome. Thank you. The very last thing that we should end with is a huge thank you to all of the people who came and gave their time to be interviewed for this um, podcast series. It's, very generous. It was very generous of them and it was so fascinating. And uh, after every interview, I felt so inspired <laughs> to be a researcher and, and to use my PhD. So it was a very eye-opening experience and a, um, a, a really interesting experience. Yes, and we're really very grateful to yeah. every single one of them. But we're also especially grateful to Dr. Sharon Pittman for yeah, telling us, gave us the, about the grant. <laughs> the inside story about the grant. Yes. yes. She gave us the inside story about the grant that we applied for and we got, which supported um, the production of this podcast. So thank you to Inspiring South Australia and to Sharon Uh, for your very generous um, support of our podcast. Thanks for listening to Career Sessions with Dr. Stephanie Champion and Dr. Tamara Agnew. If you like the show and want to know more, check out www.careersessions.com where you can send us your suggestions for future series and subscribe so you know when a new episode is posted. If you love it, tell all your friends and please leave us a review on iTunes. Thanks to our sponsor, Inspiring South Australia, for their generous support, and to our producer, Rory, at Podbooth. Join us next time when we talk careers with another leader in the field.